Greetings all. After completing something of a fire hose of a course for the army last week, I've had a heck of a lot of time to do editing for anything particularly heavy. However, I have been inspired a little bit by a post recently by Steve Zaloga over on the Book of Faces, in which he admitted he had a secret forbidden love. There are a number of candidates out there for worst tank ever. Some would say mouse. Others, who are apparently willing to risk their lives for saying so, might say Bob Semple or Tog. A very common answer would be the Valiant, and indeed it was number one on David Fletcher's list of worst tanks ever, and from the short test report that I've read I can see why. Now, that said, Ed over on the Armored Archives channel makes an argument that it wasn't actually as bad as all that. Not sure I agree with him, but you know, watch, uh, watch his video, come to your own conclusions. Covenanter also has claim to the title, uh, but again there is a bit of recent research indicating that by the time it left service much of the trouble had been fixed. However, all these tanks are, comparatively speaking, fairly well known. And the following ones, however, not so much. The vehicles in question are the Dutch Order Marmon Harrington tanks. Stephen described the Aberdeen report he read as vituperative which sent me to the dictionary. However, I had a suspicion as to the meaning, given that I happened to have come across copies of the Aberdeen test reports of the vehicles in my own archive digging, and they are some of the most scathing reports I've ever encountered from anywhere. Now, it could perhaps have been that since these were not ordnance designs, the ordnance personnel doing the testing may have felt more free to let rip, but that doesn't necessarily make the report inaccurate. And in fairness, they did seem willing enough to point out failures in ordnance equipment as well. So, as a birthday present to Steve, I give this report on the CTMS and MTLS tanks. Now, I've no idea when his birthday actually is, so give me a little leeway. This is a thought that counts. So, as I'm going through this, please bear in mind that these are production standard vehicles built to fight in line units. These are not prototypes which you would expect would have bugs that need to be identified, worked out, and refined. There is going to be a lot of reading here. Now, ordinarily I don't go for all that much outside of what I normally do, but I think in this case it's necessary in order to get the full effect. So settle back comfortably and listen to the dulcet tones of my voice as you drift off to sleep. Anyway, Marmon Harrington are an American company at the time out of Indianapolis which had a bit of a sideline in armored vehicles. As far as tanks were concerned, their efforts before the American involvement in World War II may have left something to be desired. Uh, they did try building some light tanks for the Marine Corps, didn't really work out too well. In the meantime though, they did have the tank manufacturing capability to spare, and some countries weren't really all that picky. China ordered 240 CTLS 4TAC light tanks for its ongoing dispute with the Japanese. However, there was a dispute on the exact capability of the vehicles to be provided, and China refused to accept delivery. They were accepted into service on an emergency basis with the US Army as the light tank T-16, and sent to secondary parts of the world, pending replacement by something better. Which would prove to be basically almost anything else, really, that would be built afterwards. Almost. At least T-16 was accepted for service. The same cannot be said for the next Marmon Harrington production, the CTMS-1 TBI. It's to be noted, by the way, the documentation refers to them as CTMS ITBI as well. Uh, they are, however, commonly referred to as the three-man Dutch tank, to distinguish it from the four-man Dutch tank with its own alphabet soup of nomenclature. These were produced for the Dutch East Indies Army on an emergency basis because the preferred tank supplier, the UK, was suddenly rather focused on building vehicles for the British Army instead. However, since the Dutch East Indies failed to maintain itself as a going concern to receive most of the vehicles, and the US Army looked to doing what they did with the T-16 and using it to fill its ranks, the contract was taken over by the services of supply. And then they sent to Colonel Eddy of Aberdeen a letter in December of 1942. 
let's see. War Department Office of Chief Ordnance Washington, yet a uh, two director proving ground. The Marvin Harrington Company, Indianapolis, Indiana, manufactured a number of three man and four man tanks for the Dutch government. Due to the inability of the Dutch to utilize these vehicles, they've been taken over by US government. In order to determine the suitability of these vehicles for use by our forces, one vehicle of each type is being shipped to the proving ground, attention of Colonel X, for test purposes. Colonel X, by the way, if you're not familiar with our ordinance, uh, he's the reason that we have a lot of this material that, that was kept. Uh, da, 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 da. Upon receipt of these vehicles at the proving ground, it is requested that they be tested under such features of the standard test progress as in your judgment will determine their suitability for military use by the forces of the United States. The report of the test should show characteristics in relation to any comparable vehicles in our service and include statements as to the relative reliability, accessibility, performance in relation to the nearest standard US vehicle yet, and so on and so forth. So that sets the stage. The first vehicle we're going to talk about is the CTMS and describe neutrally as follows. Uh, the three-man Dutch tank model CTMS 1TBI, one in this case, is fabricated from half-inch armor plate with bolted construction. It is very angular in appearance and resembles light tanks Marine Corps 1937 T3 and M2A2E2. The turret is operated manually and has a traverse of 360 degrees. The armament consists of two caliber 30 machine guns mounted in the bow and a 37 mm 44 caliber automatic gun and caliber 30 machine gun coaxially mounted in the turret. Okay, not too bad so far. The suspension is vertical volute spring type similar to light tank suspensions. The track is steel connected with steel pins without bushings. So we're talking dead track here, I presume. The power plant consists of a standard four-stroke cycle liquid-cooled six-cylinder Hercules RXLD gasoline engine equipped with dual carburetion and magnetic ignition system. Powertrain consists of a conventional type 5-speed transmission, control differential, and final drive unit. Ooh, a control diff, not clutch brake. Characteristic views and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is what it was. I will also tell you that the vehicle massed in at 25,435 pounds. So somewhere just over 12 tons. And well, basically away they went. The vehicle clocked up 454 miles of operation, mainly in March and April of 1943. So your basis for comparison here, the, the Army's already got M5 light tanks and M4 medium tanks under production. Observations. And I'm not going to read absolutely everything here, but you should get pretty much the gist. The engine is rated at 174 brake horsepower, but the maximum drawbar horsepower obtained with the field dynamometer was 99 dynamic brake horsepower. By the way, excuse the noise in the background. The wife is attending a virtual gender reveal. The cooling of the engine was very inefficient. The drawbar pull is that uh, pull, I'm sorry, is not adequate and should be approximately 75% of vehicle weight instead of 29%. Tractive resistance was exceptionally high. The vehicle would not climb either the 18 inch or 24 inch vertical walls. The third bogey wheel on each side would drop below the 18 inch wall and then prevent further forward movement. And the number one bogey couldn't even get over the 24 inch. Uh, the steering brakes and parking brake held the vehicle on a 30% slope. However, the brakes would not hold on the 40% slope. The vehicle will climb slopes up to and including the 40% slope, which actually isn't bad by army standards. The engine was very hard to start and the battery was being continually discharged due to excessive use of the starter. The main causes for hard starting were faulty ignition, faulty carburetion, and a tendency for the engine to jump timing. The gear shift was very hard to operate, primarily due to the short leverage of the gear shift lever. The position of first gear is so far from second gear that the vehicle stops before a shift from first to second can be accomplished. Oh, good, good news. Operation in the sand pit was satisfactory. Vision from any position inside the vehicle was greatly limited by the small vision apertures and personnel were constantly trying to get into a position which would allow a larger field of view. Ventilation inside the vehicle was very poor, even when operating with the turret hatch open. 
Uh, heat radiated from the powertrain makes it necessary to remove glass blocks from division apertures in warm weather operations so as to secure some air circulation within the vehicle. So if you're running in warm weather, you've got to pull the armored division blocks away. Uh, a whole bunch of specifications. The following component failures were encountered during test. The ignition system was continually causing trouble due to either a weak spark or change in timing. The magneto had to be adjusted and replaced uh, and the engine retimed during 360 miles of operation. Due to hard starting characteristics of the engine, the vehicle had to be towed to start numerous times, basically push started, and the battery was discharged twice during the test. Removal of the battery from the engine compartment requires removal of the engine exhaust pipe and carburetor throttle arm. The parking brake burned out during cross-country operation after 304 miles. Uh, one bogey arm faceplate was broken at odometer 253 and it was discovered that the parts in the bogey arm assemblies are not interchangeable. Uh, basically, you couldn't take a part from one bogey and put it onto another bogey. It was also not possible to order a new faceplate without ordering an entirely new bogey assembly. The vision ports consist of a rectangular casting bolted to the hull and extending inside the vehicle approximately 3 inches, as the sharp angular castings present a hazard to both drivers and assistance drivers' faces, they were covered with sponge rubber from M4 periscope headrests before the start of the test. The tow chain provided with this vehicle broke the first time that it was used. Inspection revealed that the welding of the links was inferior, steel cable is more satisfactory. The splash trays around the filler tubes of the fuel tanks are a source of trouble as they collect water and allow it to enter the fuel tanks through the filler tubes. I suspect water in the fuel tanks isn't good. During cold weather, ice forms in the splash trays and has to be chipped loose before you can open the filler caps. The headlight grills are of no value and prevent the cleaning of the headlights after operation of muddy terrain. The grills should be eliminated to allow cleaning of the headlights and to permit more light to be delivered to the road. The guards around the headlights do provide sufficient protection against breakage. So your headlights suck, but at least they won't get broken. And I should say that it is basically the best thing that is mentioned in this entire report, is that the headlight guards protect the headlights. Then there is a slew of failures. So when they got it, it had 101 miles on the clock. Uh, shield, cable from battery to generator broken loose, and the bulb instrument panel were burnt out. They got 56 miles before the uh, throttle return spring broke. Uh, a spark plug wire ignition, uh, ignition wire cracked. Uh, they had to clean the spark plugs. They had to retime the engine after 58 miles of operation. Clean the carbs. Uh, starter switch wire had worked loose and needed to be replaced. Then they got another 100 miles. And that's when the bogey face arm, uh, bogey arm faceplate fell off. So they rep repaired it by welding because they couldn't get a replacement or take it off another tank or anything. Uh, chain toe broke. Water and fuel system stopped engine. Well, who saw that coming? Uh, distributor, broken high tension contact on rotor. That's at uh, 300 miles in. Battery had to be replaced at 400 miles. Magneto be replaced at 402 miles. Uh, track shoe had to be replaced at 405 miles, parking brake burned out to 430 miles, and also there was an oil leak in between the oil filter and the engine block. Magneto adjusted 461 miles, carburetors had to be adjusted at 461, the battery had to be replaced again at 525, so this is after 101, so that was at 404, 424 miles. Starter failed at 553, or 452 operated. Yeah. Following observations. Failure of one track block and one bogey arm faceplate in all of 304 miles of operation indicate that the suspension would be a major source of trouble. Suspension parts are not interchangeable on the same vehicle or of vehicles of the same type. None of the suspension parts are interchangeable with the existing standard vehicles. The suspension provides a very rough ride, which is hard on the operating personnel and contributes to a jumpy farming platform. Uh, the hull, so half an inch of armor again, offers no protection from enemy fire from caliber 50 upwards. The hull and turret are constructed entirely with bolts and nuts. 
Under combat conditions, this type of construction is hazardous to the operating personnel. You would have thought by the 1940s that I figured this out. The entire interior of the vehicle is too cramped and none of the crew members have sufficient space to enable them to function efficiently. The exterior of the vehicle is very angular with practically all plates presenting a vertical surface to the most probable line of fire. The front particularly is not designed to deflect enemy fire as it is constructed in three almost vertical steps. Maintenance is difficult to perform in this vehicle due to the inaccessibility of the engine and powertrain. The engine is mounted low in the engine compartment and very little space is around it. The powertrain is covered with cowling which has to be removed and space inside the vehicle is too limited to permit efficient work. Yeah. Okay, we have concluded that there's not much good to be said about this tank. Now, if you're curious how it actually worked out, uh, the gunner would sit to the left of the gun. Uh, the position was described as extremely cramped with his right shoulder hitting the cradle of the gun. The left shoulder was jammed up against the turret wall. Traversing was difficult because the ring and bearings were rusted, which I suspect is a possible concern in the Dutch East Indies. They strike me as being somewhat of a potentially humid environment. So, okay, in conclusion, after all this, the report states, and quote, the vehicle is thoroughly unreliable, mechanically and structurally unsound, underpowered and equipped with unsatisfactory armament. It is recommended that these vehicles be considered unsatisfactory for use by any armed force of the United States. Interestingly, you know, the vehicles did still somehow get around. The ones that Dutch did receive ended up in random locations of Dutch influence. Ecuador bought a dozen after its conflict with Peru. We saddled Mexico with four of them for some unknown reason, possibly because they already were using some other Mormon Harrington vehicles. Cuba took eight and kept the things in service at least officially until the 1960s and may be the only combat users of the thing, shooting up against uh, guerrillas. Guatemala also ended up with a half dozen. There are at least three currently in the US, generally in pretty miserable conditions, so in theory I can film one, but I doubt it'll be a very thorough overview. Suffice to say, none of these uh, vehicles covered themselves with glory. And you will note that I skipped over the 37mm gun. And that's because, oh, and the machine guns. Uh, that's because the four-man Dutch tank, the MTLS 1G14, has two of them. So it's double the trouble. Don't worry, we'll get there. Uh, and again, the name seems to vary, but 1G14 is what the test report says. In the meantime, I shall read the description of the MTLS. The four-man Dutch tank MTLS 1G14 built by Marmon Harrington is a 42,000 pound, so we're talking like Panzer IV weight here, a full track-laying vehicle powered by a six-cylinder liquid-cooled 240 horsepower engine manufactured by the Hercules Motor Corporation, 240 in theory at least. The vehicle is a front drive employing a five-speed transmission with a Marmon Harrington control differential drive with dual controls. So the assistant driver could drive if necessary. The Marmon Harrington all-steel 18-inch track uses outside guides integrally cast in the track blocks and suspension is a vertical volume type spring employing rubber tired bogey wheels. Okay. The hull is made of flat plates bolted together varying from one and a half inches thick on the front to half an inch thick on the top. So again, 1943 this is being tested for consideration. It was built a year earlier, but still, uh, one and a half inches thick vertical. The turret has a 360 degree traverse and it mounts two 37mm 44 caliber automatic guns, one swivel mounted caliber 30 machine gun, one caliber 30 anti-aircraft machine gun mounted on the outside of the turret. The auxiliary arm consists of three caliber 30 machine guns. Okay. Yeah. For whatever reason, Aberdeen were sent a very well-worn one which somehow had managed to put 2,400 miles on the clock. It got 20 miles before the differential failed. When they took it apart, they found that the tank had a slew of failures that was not worth repairing, and they simply asked for an entirely new tank. This new tank got 362 miles into the testing program before they finally pulled the plug. So, random tidbits. And uh, in, in fairness, it does actually start out a little bit better than the three-man tank. Uh, 
The vehicle forded 48 inches of water at a speed of approximately one mile an hour. There was no spray or splash, no water leaked into the engine or fighting compartment. The vehicle went over the 18 inch vertical wall easily in first gear and reverse. It went over the 24 inch wall in first gear but failed in reverse. Then things start turning downhill. When the vehicle was operated in the sand course, it was exceptionally slow and sluggish. This was due to the fact that the vehicle is underpowered. When comparing this vehicle with the light tank M3A1, it is found that even though the engine horsepower is approximately the same for both vehicles, the Dutch tank weighs in at 42,000 pounds, while the light tank weighs in only 28,500. The vision from any position inside the vehicle was greatly limited by the small vision apertures and both the driver and assistant driver were constantly trying to get into a position which would allow them a greater field of vision. Uh, a couple of uh, administrative or mechanical or measurement notes. After 176 miles of operation, the 10 bolts that held the left rear idler to the hub pulled loose and the idler wheel fell off. All of the bolts failed at the head. This indicates that the counterstock heads are constructed too lightly. After operating the vehicle 337 miles, the steering brakes adjustment had been taken up as much as possible and still the vehicle could not be maneuvered satisfactorily. So the differential was inspected. The brake drums were found to be cracked. The brake bands were completely worn out. Since the control diff is the same type and size as one used in the three man tank of about half the weight, it is believed that this control differential is too small for the four-man tank. During the entire operation of this vehicle, considerable difficulty was encountered with track pin failure. Now, this is a fun one. The way the track was on a Marmon Harrington, if you imagine this is a Marmon Harrington and the Marmon Harrington wishes it was one of these, has a rivet on one side, uh, on the inside, and it has a bolt or retaining mechanism, I think it's a bolt, on the outside. And what would occasionally happen is that the rivet would fall off there would be nothing holding the track pin in and it would work its way out and then the track would fall apart. The proposed solution was to put the right track on the left side and the left side on the right track and then a la T34 construct a ramp at the back so that if the pin was sticking out too far and about to fall out it would get whacked back into place. They did not actually attempt to do so because the test was cancelled before anybody bothered. To drive this vehicle any length of time was very tiring since the steering levers are extremely short. So an extension of 11 inches was added to the levers and this reduced the minimum turning effort necessary to turn the vehicle from 100 pounds of pull to 60 pounds of pull. Even with this reduced steering effort, the vehicle was tiring to drive because of the cramped quarters, small vision ports and short gear shift lever. Uh, and that's basically as far as they got. So, so far, the tracks fall off, the wheels fall off, uh, the engine is not powered enough, the armor is useless considering the time. Uh, by the way, there's no mention in this report anywhere of a radio. There's no mention of the headlight guards in this report either, so I don't know if they, even they work, but let's assume that they did. The engine compartment is watertight, but maintenance is a bear. The steering and brakes fail quickly. The, um, the engine leaks oil. Let's see what else we've got. So on to the weaponry. Perhaps it can be redeemed here because it sounds impressive. Starting off with the machine guns. So as mentioned, the CTMS came with two in the hull. One was fixed for the driver to play with and one was a flexible ball mount, your, your standard hull machine gun, and it came with a coaxial. The MTLS does better. It has a ball mount in the hull, two fixed hull mounts for whatever reason. Although in fairness, if you look at the photograph, it seems to indicate that one might actually be a second ball mount, which doesn't make any more sense anyway. Why would you do it? One coaxial mount a ball mount to the right of the turret, again, no known reason, and a pintle mount for the awesome firepower of a caliber 30 against aircraft. The guns themselves were Colt MG38B2s, of which I know nothing, so I reached out to Ian for a briefing. And apparently they're basically knockoffs of the Browning 1917-1919 series, but almost none of the parts are interchangeable with the Brownings. 
According to him, the guns do work well enough, and indeed, one was test fired in the CTMS and no negative mechanical issues were encountered. That would mean that there is at least one piece of the CTMS tank with, which worked. Well, sort of. The report complained that even though Caliber 30 Colt functioned satisfactorily, its effectiveness in battle would be greatly impaired by the small amount of flexibility of the gun mount and inadequate size of the vision ports. However, because the guns did technically work on CTMS, that may have taken it out of contention for the title of worst tank, because the guns did not pass the test fire on MTLS. Not because of any particular fault with the guns, but because the mounts were so badly manufactured that they could not physically install the guns in the first place, and you'll notice that the photographs they're not installed. Either the mounting holes were misaligned so that the holes in the trunnion mounts that you, that you basically put a pin through to hold the gun in place did not line up with the holes on the guns, or the holes in the mount shields were too small to let the gun fit. So on to the 37mm gun. American Armaments Corporation M2, 44 calibers in length. It is described as an automatic gun, uh, but the test refers to it as a semi-automatic. Well, actually, the test report refers to the gun as many things, but mechanically, a semi-automatic. And in fairness, at the time, it was not unusual to see people refer to semi-automatic weapons, particularly cannons, which have manual loading, as automatic in their description. And in this case, it actually is a self-loader from a clip. It's loaded in a manner similar to a traditional semi-automatic gun. You, have, you manually open the breech by use of a detachable handle. You insert a first round in by either a couple of fingers or there is a specific loading tool. I suspect you want to use the loading tool because while you are keeping the round in place, you slowly raise the breech. You then place a five round semi-circular clip of ammunition into the feeding drum for subsequent rounds. Reloads of the clips were stowed around the hull. Three 37mm guns were available for testing. One on the CTMS, two on the MTLS. And it should be noted also that the 37mm round is not interchangeable with the US Army standard 37mm. So first, they got into the CTMS, brought it down to the range, somehow made it there. Maybe they trucked it, I don't know. But um, give an example. They fired the first round. They keep, they keep detailed records. They fired the first round at 14.40 in the afternoon. Here we go, round one, failure to eject. Okay. 10 minutes later, they're ready for round two, failed to eject. Another 10 minutes of work, round three is fired, successful ejection. Then the mounting actually seems stable and we now have ejection. Cue discussion and prep work and about a half an hour later, they load a clip into the feeder. Prepare for automatic fire. Round four, gun jams. 15 minutes later, they're gonna try again. Round five, failure to eject. These guys are nothing if not persistent. 4 p.m., round six, failure to eject. At this point, they decided to call it a day, went home, stepped on it. Next afternoon, they're back on the range, giving it another crack. Four more rounds were fired in a 35 minute period and each round failed to eject. So they decided to take the gun apart at this point, and in fairness, they believed part of the problem was the use of the wrong type of recoil oil, which prevented a long enough recoil stroke to reliably open the breech. But there was also a problem with the ramming mechanism as well, which would have prevented reloading anyway, as round four saw. Still, as I said, they had three guns to play with. So they moved to the MTLS, which no less had powered Traverse. They set to work on the left gun first. Well, why not? It's closest to the gunner. Pull trigger. Well, actually what you would do is there's a lever that you would push forward to, to fire the gun, uh, but you could fit a solenoid if you so desired. So push forward on the lever and nothing. Try again and not even a click. It turned out that the sear trip spring wasn't working and well, they also figured out that if you inserted a screwdriver through the side of the cradle, it was possible to release the sear and then fire the gun. They did think that the right gun was capable of firing after a bit of, little bit of work was done, but by this point, word came down from on high that this was all a complete and utter waste of time. The folks should stop messing around with this piece of rubbish and go play on something useful. 
In the end, the report stated, the armament on this vehicle is unsatisfactory from a standpoint of accuracy, maintenance, and interchangeability. The guns are not provided with stabilizers, and the unstable firing platform would render their fire highly inaccurate during vehicle operation. Also, due to their complex structure, they require a kit of special tools for maintenance. To sum up, the NPLS report concluded, the vehicle is slow, sluggish, and unmaneuverable since it is underpowered. The control differential oiling system is unsatisfactory. Driving fatigue is excessive since the steering levers are extremely short and the driver sits in a cramped position. Shifting the vehicle is difficult due to the shortness of the gear shift. The driver's and assistant driver's vision is inadequate. The metal track pins are unsatisfactory. The hull is ballistically unsatisfactory since it employs flat bolted plates that are practically vertical. And the 37mm tank guns use foreign ammunition. The conclusion in the report. The four-man Dutch tank model MTLS 1G14 is not a satisfactory combat vehicle for any branch of the armed forces. The vehicle is thoroughly unreliable, mechanically and structurally unsound, underpowered and equipped with unsatisfactory armament. Now again, this is a production combat tank. Valiant was a prototype. Crusader supposedly got fixed eventually and did at least perform a useful training role. They built several hundred of these Dutch order tanks and they were never fixed. The vast majority were simply scrapped immediately. A number ended up showing up as gun turrets for local defense. The Australians thought the only good thing in them was a Hercules engine which they then took out of the tank and then left the tank to rust. There seems to be absolutely no redeeming quality to this tank whatsoever. I would submit that not only is the MTLS in the running for worst tank you never heard of, it may even have a claim to being the worst tank ever, period. And so there you go. I uh, hope you found the video interesting and informative. I will see you on the next one. Take care.